Thank you, Silke. Um, let me shortly present myself. My name is Ludwig Schuster. I'm an expert in, comp uh, in complementary currencies, just like Jem Bendel, who's sitting next to me, um, and will ha hold the keynote speech. Um, I work as a researcher, consultant, and project developer in that field. And um, apart from that, I'm a co-founder and facilitator of the Sustainable Money Working Group in Berlin, um, called Wissenschaftliche Arbeitsgruppe Nachhaltiges Geld. Now, uh, to introduce the stream, um, let me first thank you, um, Silke Helfrich and the Common Strategy Group to having me invited as a stream leader for the Money, Markets and Value stream uh, at, this, uh, at this conference. It's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be here in this role and function um, in this inspiring conference. As a stream leader, I um, had to ask myself in the preparation what we would want to do and achieve within this stream? Um, the answer is not very simple, but in the end it's, it's also quite simple. We could not change the world in, t uh, in two days or two and a half days, but uh, we could, however, invite you to contribute in collectively shaping the new core paradigm of a commons economy, um, especially with regards to three major economic categories as set out in the stream title, money, markets, and value. When designing this stream, in the very beginning, we had not been fully aware of all the different positions and logics showing up when commoners start to debate the field of money. When we digged a bit deeper into the issue and discussed the stream framing in a series of Skype sessions, we discovered layer by layer the different schools of thought and uh, the lines of argumentation behind them. We discovered two main strategies how commoners deal with the money issue or to be more precise, two lines of critique regarding the money-related negative effects of our modern economy. One is the uh, one line challenges the inherent market logic of money, which is mediated exchange, the commodi uh, commodification issue, prices, and so on. The other line focuses on challenging the capitalist principles inherent in money. Um, which we have heard already um, many times today and yesterday, extraction, accumulation, and exclusion. Now, based on these three lines of argumentation, we identified three major schools of thought within the commons debate um, with respect to money. With no claim to be complete, but uh, we have tried to pinpoint them as follows. One is to demonetize, which means to organize the commons more money efficient, as has been said before, or without reproducing the inherent logic and side effects of the current monetary system, or even completely without money, leading to a search for new forms of allocation which could replace money as it is today. A second approach is to redesign money as a tool to create and sustain the commons. And I believe Jem will talk lots on this issue. The third approach, and maybe Jen will also touch upon that one, is to consider or to design money itself as being a commons. Now, our vision for our stream, and at the same time our great challenge for the breakout session tomorrow, is one, um, on the one hand to build bridges between those positions and debates. Um, while on the other hand, equally considering their role with mutual respect. We want to bring them closer together in a common picture where they can stand side by side, knowing that they are all desperately needed to get us from here to there. Now we have invited Professor Jem Bendel, Director of the Institute of Sustainability Leadership at the University of Cumbria, to throw some light on these issues and share his ideas how thinking about money in the commons or money as a commons changes our perspectives and might open up new policy and project possibilities. Together with Tom Greco, whom most of you may remember from the last conference in 2009, Jem recently published an article titled Currencies in Transition, Transforming Money to Unleash Sustainability. I think he also intended to unleash the commons. 
Jam, thank you for accepting the invitation to speak at our conference, despite your many other exciting and time-consuming activities. According to your bio, among your special interests are sustainable currency systems, the transformation of markets to promote global well-being, and responsible business development. When we saw that, we were even more convinced that you are the perfect cast to frame our stream on money, markets, and value. Now, with your keynote, Jem, um, I think you will try to enlighten us why and how the role of money needs to be redefined or redesigned in our times and open up questions, hopefully, which changes in monetary systems design could be relevant from the commons perspective. Due to your special focus on sustainable currency systems, your speech will, I think, most certainly shed the most light on that particular perspective. Correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I, I'll see it in a minute. <laughs> anyway, rather than seeing this as a deficit, we invite you all to take the chance to compensate this by contributing to our breakout session tomorrow. Uh, just a few words on the breakout session for all of you who feel inspired now or after the talk to participate in the breakout session tomorrow. Please bring your computers with fully charged batteries as we are planning to work with a, col a collaborative mind mapping tool for a co-creative documentation process. It's an experiment, and you're all invited. Now, Jem, I'm keen to hear your thoughts. I'm confident that we will get lots of inspirations from you, how money, markets, and values could somehow be commonified. Now, please welcome with me Professor Jem Bendel. You have 30 minutes. Working. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Good. Yes, thank you, Ludwig and Silke, for the invitation. Uh, when I got the invitation, I knew that because of the connection with the Peter P Foundation, you would be a phenomenal group of people, and in fact, a really daunting group of people to keynote to. So just to calm me down before I got on stage, I met uh, Wolfgang Sachs, um, the guru for me when I was at Cambridge uh, 20 years ago. Um, uh, he wrote some of the most important books uh, that, I, that I read during my geography degree. Uh, and at the time, another Sachs was off privatizing Russia. I think the UN actually got their wires crossed and started listening to the wrong, the wrong Sachs. So I'm um, very a big pleasure t to meet you indeed. Um, I, sh I'm, I don't work on the commons as such. So this has been a real fascinating journey and it continues for me right now. Uh, commons economics is something I've only really started looking at. But one thing I should say, which I've got from working as sort of a, an action-oriented intellectual or academic, is we must be careful not to thingify. Now, that's a word for the translators. Thingify. I think Martin Luther King came up with it. Uh, he said we thingify everything, uh, and, and including people. But for me, we need to be careful about that with the commons. And we maybe need to make sure we, we have some systems thinking. Uh, so, so for me, a commons is a system of relationships between people and phenomena, we could say resources, um, that has an emergent property of sustained sufficient access for all. And we can... And it's important to play with definitions and see whether they're weak or where they lead us or where they don't. But, but for me, that's the impression I'm getting anyway at, at the moment. And I think it's important to keep in mind because... And this conference is so important because at the moment, the sharing economy, P2P, collaborative consumption, this is an incredibly feel-good space, which is very atheoretical, very apolitical... Uh, very ahistoric, ahistorical, and I think there's a lack because of that. So I think this conference, by bringing up questions around, you know, looking at history, looking at theory, looking at political dimensions, is essential. So why consider money if we're considering the commons? Ludwig said a couple of things about that. Um, I'm going to say a couple of words on that, but... I think three things I want to highlight very quickly at the start, and then I'll return to them. The first one is that our current mainstream monetary system represents an almost total enclosure of 
our ability to trust each other, with governments, central banks and private banks working together to create the dominant means of exchange, the dominant way of people issuing credit to each other. It's all done through the banking system. But also this mainstream system drives further enclosure. It works against the commons because of the way the currencies are created, the way the credit's created. And I'm going to return to that more in detail in a moment. But I think the third reason is just because of what's happening right now. There are thousands of people worldwide who are trying very new ways of thinking and and working with currency. And they are inspired by a very collectivist or communal uh, approach to, to life and to economy. So it's where there's a lot of, a lot of uh, innovation. And there's lots of people in the room, I know, who are working on this. But one thing I really thought I should spend a little bit of time on right at the start, just to make sure we're all on the same page and therefore all can engage well in the, in the, uh, the coming sessions... Is, is the very nature of money. So most people think, when I talk to them, that money really isn't an issue. What the issue is, is how we earn it, how we spend it, how we invest it. But they don't really think about where money comes from. Now this, I presume, is a very smart audience. So when I ask for a show of hands, you'll know exactly what to do. Who here thinks money grows on trees? Okay, fine, yeah. A couple of very philosophical, inspired people there. Um, I'll, let's chat in the bar later. Uh, who thinks uh, money comes from government? Mm. Who thinks that money comes from the central banks? In this case, then, with now we have the European Central Bank, yes. Well, a few hands, a few hands, yep. And a few quizzical looks uh, as well. Who thinks... Um, Wolfgang, you haven't put your hand up yet, have you? No, good. Um, who thinks money comes from the private banking system? Ah, I see. Okay, I can go home now then. Good. So, no, but there's this, that's really interesting to see. So there is this growth in awareness of the monetary world that we live in, which is that in nearly all advanced economies today, it's over 97% of all the money we use is issued by private banks when they, make, when, they, when they issue loans. So when we go to a bank and we ask for a loan for whatever it is, it's not savers' money that they're lending to us. They're creating new money through extending credit to us. And that process is traditionally understood by most economists through something called the multi, money multiplier. But actually the, most latest, the, the latest research, for example, by the New Economics Foundation in, in a book, Where Does Money Come From?, shows that we really have non-reserve banking now. So you can just... You, they, the, the banks can lend as much as they want and then they seek to, to basically make sure they've got enough central bank reserves at the end of a period in order to uh, clear the different transactions between banks. So we have very little control over monetary supply. And this is a dominant system so that you look at the euro and you look at the pound and you look at the dollar and you think that maybe these are different things, but actually they're using the same form, the same mechanism, which is bank-issued debt as the origin of, of the money. So it's almost like you know, if you think that you're buying a Kit Kat rather than a Crunchy bar, they're different when actually it's still Nestle. The, the system behind it is the same. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, more and more people are beginning to ask much deeper questions about what this monetary system means for, for, for life. Um, the first one is, is that collectively together we're all in debt forever because this money is issued with interest. And of course the interest has to be paid with something. So what we have now is, is a case where we have compounding interest means there's more debt than there is money to pay off the debt. So the only way this system continues is if there's ever-increasing loans every year. Some, the some economics theoreticians do say that, oh, but if every 
every amount of money that, uh, that's earned through interest is then spent back into the economy, then as long as there's a, enough velocity, then uh, you can actually somehow square that equation. But that's not what happens. Uh, there's a lot of money that's profit. The profits that are made are then re lent. So this perpetual indebtedness leads to spiraling inequality. But it also means we need to grow the economy because loans will only be issued if there's additional economic activity to be conducted with those new loans. So this creates a growth imperative, which means the commodification of more of the stuff of life, turn it into a commodity where you can extract a yield, pay, generate profits in order to service the interest on the debt. So this monetary system is anti-commons. With this monetary system, you cannot grow a commons economy. It also, of course, means that there's fluctuating amounts of, of, of money in the system, and so we have boom and busts, and we have, like we do now in many places, mass unemployment, when suddenly there's a shrinkage of the amount of liquidity in an economy. We also see this, this distortion of society or life itself. Most people think, like many people you speak to, is that, well, buying a house is the best investment because prices will always go up and don't really think about why that is. But basically, if spending power is being cre new spending power is being created by banks in this way, they create this in ways that serve their own interests. So the least transaction costs... Uh, the least risk, uh, and the most return. And so what's happened is all this new spending power is basically going into the property market. In the UK, it's about 80% of all loans made to individuals is, is for property. And what this means is, I think, the campaign Positive Money published a statistic that since about the mid-1950s, property prices in the UK have gone up 8,000%. And that's because... That's how new spending power is entering the economy. Now this, we've, we, we heard, I don't know if we've used the word entrapment before, but this, this means that we, we end up with a society and even a sense of what life is like because of the origin of money in this way. So that it costs an arm and a leg in order to rest your head somewhere. You, you know, rents are high or mortgages are high uh, and all the pressures that that creates because of this system. And I hear the property boom is coming to Berlin now as well. So you can now enjoy this. You may end up soon with situations like in the UK where one of the most romantic things you can do is buy a flat together because it means you're locked in for life, really. Um, <laughs> I mean, there must be someone saying, you know, darling, do you want to buy a flat with me? And then maybe we can live happily ever after if we sit at home, watch TV, don't move a muscle so we can afford the mortgage. <laughs> so <laughs> this, 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 for me, I've come to realize that the monetary system creates all these knock-on effects and even shapes the way we experience life. We end up thinking that, uh, that, that wealth is scarce, that we must all compete because the money is scarce when actually the wealth is us and our ability to do stuff for each other and have and support a healthy environment. Who here is vegetarian? Fantastic, I love you. You're an inspiration to me. I'm almost there. <laughs> and I, I, and, but I, I think I've come to realize that we, all of us, actually live off bank debt. So... Um, unless you're growing your own, everything that arrives on your plate, veg uh, vegetables, in the end, the transactions were mediated by bank-issued debt. And so you vegetarians, like all of us, are actually bankterians. You live off bank debt, and you p participate in a society which is, uh, could be called some kind of bankterian society, a society, a totalitarian banks. Uh, a society of, of bank rule. I think a Guardian journalist once called it a bankocracy. Um, it frames everything, and it's so pervasive that people don't see it. People don't even ask the question, where does money come from? 
So what to do about it? Well, who here uh, works... Who here has an account with some kind of funny money? Look at that. Funny money, alternative, alternative types of currencies. There we go. Quite a few people there. Great. So... What's really exciting is that a lot of people in this space have moved from this slightly philosophical critique to actually getting on with doing something about it. Bitcoin has probably done one of the most, uh, the, the, the most to raise awareness in the general public about this. Um, uh, who hasn't heard of Bitcoin? See, so there's just a couple of hands going out. Bitcoin is sometimes called a cryptographic currency. It's an entirely, entirely digital currency. It's global. Basically, you download a bit of code, and, the, and that's a wallet, and it, pro, it, looks, for, looks, for, um, it looks to mine, uh, basically by calculating algorithms, it uh, looks to mine bitcoins, and it provides you with a payment infrastructure worldwide. So it's a currency with no official s- sort of issuer and no banks involved, uh, and it provides anonymity for its users. Uh, it's, it fluctuates massively. There are a lot of people speculating around it. It behaves as if it's a commodity, even though it's entirely virtual. But I think one of the most exciting currencies, because it's so ordinary and has been around for so long, is the one in the middle there. It's called the Veer Bank. The Veer Bank has existed since, I think, 1934 in Switzerland, and it has over 65,000 business members. It does, I think, about $2 billion equivalent worth of trade every year. And what it is, is simply an accounting system between the members on this platform. So that if you're a small business and the cost of a loan to restock your supplies uh, is, is too high, the interest rates are too high, or maybe the bank doesn't want to extend that credit to you, you have another option, which is to uh, borrow in Veer, where one Veer is notionally equivalent to one Swiss franc. And 65,000 other, 65, other companies in Switzerland will accept it as payment. So it means that just because there's maybe a tightening of the um, credit environment with Swiss francs, it doesn't mean that you stop trading. And that's what, the re- that's what recession is all about. It's not about suddenly we become poor. We have the same skills, same talents, same hopes, same buildings, same climate, maybe. Um, but the monetary, so the, the shrinkage in, in money supply. So it, this is a, a B2B mutual credit system for, for official terms. Um, another system which is, and I think uh, Susan Vitt is, is here. Are you here, Susan Vitt? Hello, good to meet you. Um, you, you I, th- these are your things up here, are they? The, uh, the Burke shares. So another form of currency, and correct me if I'm wrong, is where uh, an organization then issues a currency which is convertible to some other national currency and is backed by that national currency. And you can do it in certain ways in terms of how, who can redeem it and how and what penalties there might be or a period on the redeemability, maybe even an expiry date. But this is done in a way to encourage people to understand money better, but also to encourage more local trade. There's a, a project that I'm helping a bit with at the top there called the, the Bangla Pesa in Kenya, just just started now. And what the Bangla Pesa is about is, um, can be called a, a local fiat. Basically, an organization that's trusted by the community is issuing these notes and not actually making it convertible. But they are circulating, they're providing a new medium of exchange. The idea then is to take that online, integrate it with SMS, and turn it into a, a, a person-to-person, peer-to-peer mutual credit system. And they're doing that with Community Forge, which is a, a tiny NGO that I, I help a bit with, and Matthew Slater is the, the uh, co-founder there. Um, basically now there's about, um, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's a, a, over 60 active currencies around the world. These are community currencies, and they use the free open source software that Community Forge provides. And there's about, is it 4,000 uh, members active every month? And so th- this, again, is, is that people can trade with each other without official money. And so they may be cash poor, but it doesn't mean they lack 
the desire to be useful to each other. Many of you probably have heard of time banks, which again is another, another um, form of, often it's issued in, in a mutual credit way, um, but where one hour is the unit of account. Now that often is done in a way which is to try and challenge the assumptions of the marketplace and to promote equality. Uh, and so I think that's a useful thing to note because different currency designs uh, have different motivations and represent different values, but also then have different potential for scaling and for encroaching into the mainstream market space. Um, Ludwig works uh, on a really interesting area where you could have currencies that are issued as promises uh, to deliver future goods and services, for example, kilowatt hours. So you can have uh, companies that produce renewable energy then issuing promises to redeem uh, a kilowatt hour renewable energy. And then that, if you get a sufficient number of companies behind it and people recognizing it, can also then circulate as a currency and also possibly even then fund the kind of uh, economic activity we want to see, such as renewable energy production. What I particularly like about Community Forge and why I think that really relates to the commons is that the philosophy is we need to restore what Tom Greco calls the credit commons. We need to provide opportunities for people to trust each other in ways which will enable transactions. So... I, the, the amount that I can do for any one of you or you could do for me should not somehow be regulated by decisions made through global banking system that provides the liquidity for us to transact. We can actually come up with systems together for either self-issued credit, like with, with punk money, Eli's here who invented punk money, um, where I, know, I promise to... Well, uh, can you tweet it now? Um, I'll... I, ha I have to do this with the, the founder of Punk Money. Um, um, tweet me something and then I'll, I'll redeem it later. <laughs> or I, I, I don't want to stop, otherwise I'd have to do it here and, and I know you, I should get to the end of my speech. But this is, it's, it's a shift in thinking about how we can issue credits to each other, IOUs to each other. And I think that is, very much, that is currency as commons rather than just currency supporting the commons. Now, when I was thinking about what to talk about today, and I was hearing all the debates last night as well about what is the commons, I was very excited by how this is, a, this is the kind of conversation that needs to happen. As I was saying earlier, the, the, the P2P space, the sharing economy space, is quite atheoretical, ahistorical, apolitical. We need to have this conversation. But I'm a bit worried that this whole process, we could end up disappearing up our own asses, really. Because we, in, in so many fields I've worked on, as more money and funding comes into the space, then people end up spending all their time talking to each other, uh, huge you know, essays written and books and chapters, etc., debating the finer points of things. But what we really need to do is better help each other to act and to build the commons. So with that in mind, and because I've been speaking for 20 minutes, what I want you to do is to turn to your neighbour and ask them, what is it that motivates you to work in support of the commons. Now, if, um, if they say, well, they don't, <laughs> um, then, then maybe you, you have something to share, and then you can say what motivates you to work in the commons. Just do this for a couple of minutes, and then I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll just hear something back from you all.
So I'm going to now ask, ra randomly ask, for three words. I hope you are listening well to your colleague, because I'm going to ask you for three words that summarizes the essence of what you've heard of the intention of your conversation partner. Jan, three uh, uh, Jan, three words that summarize what you've just heard as the intention. Silence, please. Let's just get some feedback. Peace and a spiritual component and access to both of those. Peace and s spirituality. A third word? Equal access to those. Okay, and equal access. Who else wants to summarize the essence of what they've just heard? No, uh, well, f fair access and uh, f future generations, uh, intergeneration justice. Okay. Good, thank you. Social interaction with people. Social interaction with people. Almost three words. Okay, any... Any, anyone here want to share? Yes, okay. Social justice, equality. Okay, so we've heard of peace, spirituality, justice, um, and so on. Anything down here? Uh, access and public space. Public space and access. So there are... Who, who um, hands up if those are the themes that you either expressed or have just heard yourself and your pairs? Hmm. Don't be shy. Hand. Uh, okay, so I would say half. So there's other stuff that hasn't been shared. In that case, uh, what hasn't been shared? Let's just get some other ideas just to hear the essence of people's intention for working in this field. Who didn't have their hand up? Yes. Talked about people's well-being. That was people's well-being. Anything else? Fun. Fun. There we go. Fun. Hands up. Who had fun in the yeah, in the conversation? There we go. Okay. So joy, being human, rather than being worried about what's in it for me all the time. Survival as well. Okay. Um, now, there's some. There's something. There's something very elemental and human and beautiful about why people work on the commons and things that are people working on that are coming here. But I think we've got a problem because um, if we want to really become more of a social movement, we need to learn from social movements of the past. And therefore we need to develop not just the intellectual theories but actually the sense of common identity. Powerful social movements have that sense of shared identity. And, of course, we come from all parts of the world as well, so that also poses some challenges for the cultivation of that. But I think it's essential. And therefore, we have a problem, because in the English language, the word commons is pretty rubbish. I mean, if you're common in England, then you're a bit rough and no one will, you know... Um, you're a bit ordinary. Um, commoning doesn't really doesn't really no one uses that language so we, we have a challenge we have a, a, a bra you know I work in, in in a management school we have a bit of a, a marketing problem and just because we question the dominant dominant way of thinking in, in, in markets doesn't mean we can't learn bits and bobs from uh, successful uh, players in the markets so we need we need a we need a good brand and in fact branding came before markets I mean you know the crucifix is pretty pretty important brand so <laughs> We, we, what are we? I'm going to make a suggestion, which is that I think that most people, when they talk about the commons, think of enclosure, they think of people worrying about protecting things or holding back progress. I'm not talking about us, the freaks and geeks who know about all this stuff. I'm talking about, you know, people who read The Sun, uh, watch Sky Television, whatever, even the BBC, in fact, those who do watch the BBC. So... We need something more dynamic that reflects how we are actually more focused on restoring the commons and building and creating future commons. And so I thought, well, maybe a term like this, which sort of recognizes that the real action in the common space are people who are pioneering, who are creating new forms of commons. And that was, this is, I mean, there may be other terms and obviously in other, other um, 
languages, maybe the, the, the word commons works much better. But for me in English, I think to say that we are commoners also reflects the importance of intention and of people. It's not about a, f- a resource or a phenomena out there. It's about how we relate and what our intention is. And it's the people I know in this space who've inspired me. People like Matthew who've inspired me because he's committed his whole life for the last five years to building up the software commons for community currencies. Theories would just put me to sleep. So we have to focus on the individuals and what, who we are and what we're doing. So... Um, And we have to shift the debate and we have to come up with as fancy, sexy terms as the tragedy of commons, but which actually turn that on its head. We have to talk about how we are unlocking the treasury of the commons. We must really think about how we can communicate about what what it is that we're doing, how we are reconnecting people to our original wealth. And we have to do that very fast. This is a photo from September last year, taken by NASA. The yellow line shows the average least amount of summer uh, ice in the Arctic in the 80s and 90s. So you can see from September last year, NASA found that half the ice was missing. That's a piece of ice the size of the Indian subcontinent. So Also, I don't know if you saw the news recently, we've gone past 400 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. And we know how all the rather pathetic attempts to do anything about it called carbon trading is really stumbling now. So there's... If if we truly believe this deep critique of the current monetary system that I presented earlier, which demands ever more turning of life itself into commodities to be traded, to generate profits, to serve this massive debt monster, then we really have to make sure that what we're doing on the commons is actually scalable and can actually be scaled quickly. In order, because otherwise, we may be all very proud of ourselves and, we, you know, and what we're doing and be very pleased with ourselves, but actually we're going to be swept away with the tide of climate change and the massive disruption that it's going to be bringing. So we must keep that bigger picture in Mind And for me, I think there's three areas, therefore, that we need to look at. One is the amazing power of new technologies to be truly disruptive to the social and economic order. Let's not forget, Twitter didn't exist seven years ago, but played a role in recent revolutions. Facebook didn't exist nine years ago. So I think, really, let's look at how we can support innovative currency types with key commons design principles, but actually could build a new generation of currencies, perhaps through distrib- not like a, a mutual credit style of, of Bitcoin, for example, and provide real alternatives, which mean we no longer have to worry about persuading politicians to listen to us. We can actually create the future ourselves and in a way which cannot be switched off. The second thing is we need allies, We need allies to achieve scale. And I think in the monetary space, those allies could be local governments. Uh, And there are amazing examples where local governments have decided to back local currencies and help facilitate them, even accept tax in them, or offer to pay uh, for local public services in them. And I think that, as well, with the pressure on many local governments' budgets, means that there could be really useful allies to be found there. And the third thing is we need a much better political voice. We do have things like the Pirate Party. It's great they're here. We're also Julian Assange is running for election and there's a sort of a WikiLeaks party starting. But we need, a, we need a, a political philosophy and a political voice in order to protect the commons and help scale it. And um, I, I'm really keen to hear where is that happening. Because we... No, I mean, here in Berlin, I I was here 20 years ago, the last time I was here, and as I was coming in and I realized that, of course, this place in Europe reminds us about how massive change is possible. Massive peaceful change is possible, absolutely. Beautiful change, beautiful, peaceful, massive revolutionary change is possible. So if you work in money, what I've realized is that it's a whole paradigm shift. And... For me, it's, it's really helped tear down the wall between this fake ideology of left and right. It tears down the wall between this false dichotomy between austerity 
or more borrowing and spending. It tears down the wall between us and our environment. It tears down the wall between the sense of what we truly desire and what we think we can only afford. Suddenly we realize that wealth is ours to unlock and discover and create together and we actually have to just help free each other up to do that. So for me, the truly revolutionary transformative potential of the commons must have monetary issues at the centre of its critique, analysis and proposals. And that's why Ludwig's session is fantastically important and you should all come along. Thank you. Hello, I'm Mike Linksfair, coordinator of the Knowledge Stream. The purpose of the Knowledge Stream is to help make the commons the core paradigm for knowledge commoners. Various knowledge common movements are not in seed form. In fact, we've made tremendous progress in sharing and preserving human culture, also known as piracy. We run the Internet's infrastructure. We're making considerable progress in sharing the sum of all human knowledge, also known as the Wikimedia movement. We're making good progress on providing access, unfettered access to uh, the academic literature um, where... As WikiLeaks was just mentioned, we're providing transparency to how they rule. So this is this is not a seed form at all. However, it might be a, it might be a stunted form. There's almost no uh, awareness of the concept of commoning across these knowledge commons movements. There's no solidarity across them. And so I was very excited when uh, David and Sulka and Michelle invited me to coordinate the, the stream because what better place to tackle this need to turn these very successful knowledge commons movements into self-aware commons movements and, again, put the commons at the core of their, um, at the core of their paradigm because right now, even the most successful ones are couched in terms of, even in their self-discourse, are couched in terms of the uh, property discourse and see themselves as carving out, if they use the word commons, small commons that exist within the legal regime of default censorship. And for reasons of respectability and mind washing, um, have no aspirations, or very few have have aspirations to to break out of that to break out of that paradigm and make a fundamental fundamental critique. So, what better uh, place again to try to make to uh, try to turn the knowledge commons movements around, um, but in front of other commoners. Now, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce the uh, keynote speaker who I have been a colleague of, in a sense, for about eight years. We've worked on the uh, Creative Commons project, which is one of the successful but not very self-aware knowledge commons movements, uh, even though it uses the, the word commons. Um, and so I'm incredibly excited about uh, Carolina's uh, keynote because I think it will 
um, be evocative uh, in terms of what this stream is intended to accomplish and presage a, a fantastic uh, discussion tomorrow of all of these phenomena that I just uh, talked about, but in terms of the commons, not in terms of the impact of sharing on the business model of the content industry or uh, what the appropriate intellectual property license um, is in constructing our little portion of the protected world. So, on to the, the formal introduction. Uh, Carolina Bertero is a Colombian activist for access to knowledge, a lawyer, a member of the uh, Charisma Foundation, part of the free software community, co-leader of Creative Commons Colombia, and regional manager for Latin America at Creative Commons. So I welcome Carolina Botero. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to start by saying thank you to all of those who invited me here, and especially to Silke, David, and Mike, that were very kind to, to help into the presentation. Um, I, I, of course, do not want to charge on them. The responsibility on the presentation is fully mine if you like it. If you don't, then blame them because they helped. <laughs> um, how do I put this? Can you help me here, please, to put it there? Um, I, I want to advise at the beginning. I am an activist, so I don't know about anything in deep. The experts, those, you are the experts on this. And then, of course, uh, what I do know about is a lot of digital commons, a lot of what Mike said I shouldn't talk about. So I was forced to use examples of my daily life. Just mercy with me if I'm not expert on what I'm going to use. Anyway, my presentation is What If Fear Change Sites? I want to start by saying um, that this is the relation I want to start with. Uh, if, we, if we acknowledge that information is power, if we acknowledge that knowledge is power, we should then acknowledge that controlling both either or both information and uh, knowledge, we will have power. Uh, why does this relation matter? Because the control of information and knowledge can change sides. And this is important because the power relation can be changed. This relation, power, change, is what means fear. If we manage to change the relation of power, or if, if we manage to think that we can do it, we are generating a fear. And at least in what I work day to day, that's what we we understand all the enclosures that we're seeing in the last decades are not less, not more than fear. Fear from uh, the change of this power relation. So they asked me to talk about information and knowledge and not to talk about what I know, which is digital part of it. So let me start by saying that um, how we produce knowledge and information, how we, how we distribute it, how we use it matters. And this is what we're going to talk about. There is a very pessimistic point of view to this, but we are here to talk about commons, commoners, commoning. So we should start by recognizing that we are lucky. And there are still many ways to do things, to produce, to use things. And therefore, I would like to pose to you some more like questions rather than uh, strong affirmations, strong sentences. The first two is how can we switch the tendency of knowledge regulation away from enclosure? How can commons become the rule and not the exception? And then I, I will have to also point out something the speaker just before me said. Commons is a, not a nice word in English where you're lucky. In Spanish, we don't even have it. So this is very important. We're constructing, we're building 
the knowledge and we have to start by posing the right questions. The first example I'd like to point out as to, I, I will remind you these two questions, how we switch tendencies, how can we make it a rule and not an exception. My first, my first example is midwives, Spanish parteras. The midwives, um, if you have read something in feminism, and of course there are many of them here, and, and in history and whatever, you, you know the strongest enclosure that these persons, normally women who help other women to deliver babies, were submitted to. They were witches sometimes. They were totally left aside when the doctors, essentially men, took their place. And the whole relation with birth even changed altogether. So the idea of the way we deliver today in hospitals with the doctor aside is completely different to the way it should have been if it was in another place. In Colombia, uh, we have very remote places. So there are under a lot of uh, indigenous culture, black communities, so on. There's a lot of uh, popular knowledge still in the air. And probably non there are a lot of places where a doctor don't even show up. So that's, that's your doctor there. And there is right now a huge movement that is uh, especially driven by this woman that is... Uh, Rosmilda, the older one from the picture, and she's a uh, partera from the Pacific part of Colombia that's been moving the pride of being a partera and the right to exercise her work. There's even uh, a, a draft law. They're trying to push it up to make it legal because right now it's illegal and to make a whole movement towards them as being able to help Others, not just the woman who's in delivery, but also the doctors. Okay. What they want is to be recognized as, as somebody that can do something which is legal, not illegal, and that they know. So it's a recognition of knowledge. Um, my second question will be, can we switch market logics by showing there are other logics? Okay, first example is the written music in Colombia, uh, Spanish partituras, the written music in Colombia in the 18th and 19th century was basically manual. It was written by hand, and it was copied by hand up, up until very into the 20th century because there was not really a market for that. So people would just share it and pass it on and whatever. However, all the intellectual property laws that came into force talk about industries. And of course, we're protecting industries from the north. And in the U.S., you do have an industry that produces massively the, these partituras, this written music. Not in Colombia, but now we're tied to the intellectual property laws. And intellectual property laws says that those uh, protected works that are not printed, are not published, have a strong moral right. And the only one can allow a reproduction, modification, anything, is the author or the right holder. Therefore, today, all the, literally all the students in Colombia that study music are totally pirates because it's impossible to have music that otherwise would be in the public domain used by them. It's easier to use classical music from Europe probably than to have a nice balls from 19th century in Bogota that was played in Bogota being used by them. They can't photocopy. They, of course they do it. But I mean, why? Why to have this kind of enclosures? And to pose a, an example that is more tangible for maybe all of us and more recent, Silke said, put some numbers, but I just found that it was nicer a picture. This is World Mapper, and it shows you the 2002 relation of income by royalties in the world. So instead of the space, the, the, yeah, the kilometers a country occupy in the map, it's been changed by the number, by the income a country received during 2002 for royalties. Of course, Africa disappeared. Japan is a huge continent. 
US takes most of what it's America probably, and well, UK it's bigger than Europe, and so on and so on. This this shows you the relation. So there is no an innocent position on the way that uh, intellectual property is being craft during the last decades. It's really been done to uh, privilege to give a, a to keep the position for some of them. Again, sorry, my examples are mainly intellectual property because that's what I work on. So I would, after these couple of examples, I want to say that there's a problem with our imagination and knowledge. I'm not referring to this specific group, but humanity. Imagination and knowledge is a problem because we're having problems to imagine how to provision and govern resources, information, and knowledge. We just can think on exclusivity and control when we think on this. So oral imagination and knowledge, we can't think it without exclusivity and control. And that's a relation that we have to switch in order for us to switch the relation of power. My other question will be, can we measure commons values? This morning, by hearing an economist uh, that thinks from, from the side of, of the commons, Joshua, I was excited. I can't, I've not been able to find in Colombia one economist that will help us to think about commons, at least not the ones we can afford, because there must be a lot. I mean, in Colombia, we do have a strong tradition on commons, and that's water, and they are talking on mining, on water, on those things. But digital commons, no way to just think on Google then, Yahoo. It's not possible. But how can we measure common values? How do I go to a politician and tell him, you know, what libraries do matters? And that has relation with copyright. Can we replace individual incentives as core in the knowledge regulation and there, intellectual property takes, again, an important place. I'm not going to try even to say this in French, but those of you who have been in, Ly in Lyon will know that this is the main square of Lyon. And there was a, an important um, court decision on, on this square. The old picture is the former square. The new picture is the new square. It was redesigned in order to put some parking lots down and to facilitate the tourism and so on. So an ar the architect and the artist who did this had an, a right, a copyright over the new landscape for the urban city. When the when the square was finished and the photographers came to take pictures and make the new postcards, they start, uh, they sue this postcard company because they were the copyright owners for the new design of the square. That was, uh, of course, a trial. And finally, the judge decided that this was an accessory, an accessory right related to the principal right and the principal, the, sorry, an accessory <coughs> It's not good. Bien, un bien accessorio, an accessory wood that has that has to follow the destiny of the main wood, which is the square as a whole. And the square, really, most of it is public domain. So just don't bother. Your copyright follows the public domain. Let them take the pictures. That's kind of funny, also, because it poses the situation of private versus public. Not really common. It's private versus public. Another, this one I'm really scared now. I was in the water group, and you know a lot about water. I don't. Sorry. But in Colombia, there's a lot of people who knows about water, and there are lots of commoning. I'm just placing this example because it really has to be with me. We have a problem, again, because there has been attempts of privatization, but the real problem for me in the water right now, especially for small, muni for small municipalities in Colombia, is that the aqueducts have become public, and all the big municipalities and the state and departments and so on have told the little municipalities, that's a good, you just take care of it, 
charge for the water and take care of it. And that's what they do. They charge and they provide water. They try to do it for everybody. But most of the small municipalities are not taking care of the water. And that was evident during the last strong winter we have. Colombia, for those of you who don't know, we're in the tropic, so we really don't have the seasons. We call winter when it rains and summer when it's sunny. So saying this, a strong winter, which means a lot of rain. And despite the fact that there was a lot of rain, there were a lot of little towns that were without water. The place where we have a small summer house in uh, close to Bogota was without water. And we start looking at why. The reason is nobody's taking care of the aqueduct to just charge and give, and they pay a salary to somebody that will go and make it uh, drinkable, and that's it. The situation is like that in many, many places in Colombia, despite the fact that it used to be a commons, and there were a lot of people looking at it. But the switch, there was a point on the switch where states stopped giving money to care about water, and they are just charging and getting the, and getting the, the water. I want to say with this that that's the situation in all Colombia. No, the paper behind the picture shows very successful small commons aqueducts in Medellin, a huge city. 30% of the water in Medellin is managed through commons practices and not through the central aqueduct of Medellin. So there are very diverse things going on there, but what I care the most is that the individualism point of view of many of them is putting in a terrible position, small towns in Colombia, the second country who has the most diversity and the most rain in the world. No, no way to say that that's for us. So in these kind of situations, can we blame individualism or have we inadequately articulated the value, either qualitative, quantitative, or any of the commons? Or have we missed adequate infrastructures and tools to raise the common? This third point is important. We do have to think about infrastructures because they care. So if we call ourselves commoners and, and we try to, we have to be consequent with it. Call it money, call it software, whatever. I'm not going to go in deep in here because I have a limited time, of, but I want you to think about that also on infrastructures. So, finally, and just to put myself where I know, because I am an activist on intellectual property law, I would like to put you this last question. Can we introduce the commons discourse from the front door and not from the back door? And by saying this, I will start by blaming myself. I don't do that. Normally, what I do is, the, is that I try to include the commons into this discourse, but... Since the debate is based on knowledge requires enclosure, what I do is I put it through the back door. And I'll explain this. The picture you're looking at is just an infographic of TPP, which I think, who of you do not know anything about TPP? Okay, so I'll explain then. So TPP is the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. The Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement is the new, if you have heard about ACTA, NAFTA, TAFTA. So TPP is the one for the Pacific. And it's the new uh, kind of club for some countries to do the, to, to get into a commercial agreement that includes a lot of things, but among them intellectual property. <coughs> With this agreement, we will raise even more the minimum standards of, um, of intellectual property, fighting piracy, and this will mean more years, I think 120 years of protection uh, for some certain um, intellectual property goods. Uh, there's going to be uh, more measures on DRMs, that's the digital locks. So when you buy a CD, it has a digital lock. You can't copy it to the MP3. Of course, you call your son and, and he does it for you. 
But in Colombia, the son will be facing four to eight years jail. And that's not normal, but the TPP will raise it for all of you. Uh, and kind of that small measures, but all together, it's an, a more, uh, a bigger enclosure. The point is, when, when I as an activist go to the, to the politicians, it's not a brand to say, I come here on behalf of the commons, as you said. I have to say, you know what? Well, really, in copyright law, there's something that's called public domain. And we have to take care of it too. So you can't just keep on putting more and more time of protection because eventually we will not have public domain. And that's not good. You know why? Because on, on the public domain, you can use it and privatize it. And really, that's what Disney did. And he made a huge amount of money on that. I mean, really, really. Who, who can say that Cinderella was, was Disney's good idea. It was here in Europe, I don't know, three centuries ago. It, he just took it from the public domain and made it for the customer that today needs. But he just went now to keep Cinderella there. So if I explain it like that, the politician will understand me and might change his mind. I can't go with the commons because it will take me three years, something that I could explain in two words. So I blame myself because this is what I do, and it's exactly what Michael Mike start by saying. This is what the um, how do you call it the exit the uh, exit the the successful movements that use commons are doing. We are hacking the law, but we are not doing it upfront. So I'm here, and I want to continue coming to commoners' meetings to remind me that there is one day probably when I will do it through the phone door. And uh, when we were discussing my presentation, this sentence jumped out of Silke's voice. She said it was through a discussion with Severin Dusolier, and this more or less was the conclusion. And this is from a lawyer mind, very difficult to understand. But I am trying to make it, you know, something uh, to look at when I wonder the day I can come through the front door. So intellectual property reform and licensing are just a small part of a universe of knowledge commoning. Movements like transparency, privacy, collaboration, the money, all that part are potentially all of science and culture too. That's why probably you miss in this presentation talking about Wikipedia and all those wonderful digital commons I do know a lot about. But the idea was precisely to let you know that when we talk about information and knowledge, there is a very transversal discourse that we have to find and build together. In order to do that, I just want to leave you with three ideas. <coughs> I couldn't bring coffee for all of you, so I brought a small and nice flu to share. <laughs> when and how did we accept that the autonomy of all is subservient, oh, that English, to control of knowledge by few? How come? And that's the question for myself. I all, the, all the time I have to come with the few because the majority says this, or a lot of them, this is a question. Can we stop this? Can we change it? Is the current tragedy our lack of knowledge in the commons? And again, these three points are merely for me, especially my own reflection. So again, starting with what, sorry, finishing with what I started. Information is power, knowledge is power. So controlling information and knowledge means to have power. There are no innocent laws behind this. I, I wrote two sentences here because I knew I was going to forget it, so I'll read them that like right now so you think on this relation. When I show you the reading music, I was meant to say it. Market logics, market logics drive the current statu quo in the regulatory framework, increasing social economic inequality and diminishing public spaces every day. 
When I show you the square in France, I was meant to say, legal system of intellectual property place individual financial incentives at the center of knowledge regulation, marginalizing common values. So I just wonder if we think about this and we think means to change the power relation, could we change? Is, it, there's, is there any chance that we can change sites and make them fear change of the regulation? Thank you very much. I mean, this, 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 um, I want to start with that, uh, you, because you didn't ask me what I heard in the, in the dialogue of what is my motivation to work for the Commons, and it's, it's basically what I feel here in this room, and especially after your two wonderful keynotes and the examples you brought to us, it is this energizing thing that I was at some point tired to look at the problems and to look at the problems and to open the newspaper and to listen to the news and to look at the problems and again and again. And just if, if I'm with commoners, if, if, if I'm kind of seeing the incredible <coughs> knowledge that is out there and creativity that is out there and, and precisely what you reminded us, that it's, it's about making, start to do things. So that is what I... Uh, Really, is when I move around in the commons world, that is what really gives me energy to move forward. So, um, and that is what I felt after your two presentations. Just wow, <laughs> we had a heavy day, <coughs> and you managed uh, almost at the end of the day to energize this crowd. Look at it, still full, nobody left. <laughs> Here we go, and we have only, I'm, I'm very sorry to say that, I, I, I think we will take a bit, a little bit. Um, We'll share this intellectual energy first and then the material energy a bit later. Do you agree? So we'll, we'll take a little bit of our break of our dinner. Great. Because this is the last part of our, of our program, official program today almost in terms of speaking and talking. And uh, we should not miss the opportunity just to give you the word and express what you of feeling in this pretty moment, what you want to ask to our keynote speakers, and I suggest we do it the same way we did it this morning, right? Just we take two or three or four so do, that you even might be able to refer to each other, and, uh, and then we give the word back to the panel, and we can do this twice, if you agree, um, and, um, and then we have a couple of announcements to make. That's it. Here you go. In front. Yes, I'm uh, Anne Snick from the Flora Network uh, that produces knowledge with women in poverty. Um, it's not, I, I cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, okay, is this better? Okay, so I'm Anne Snick from Flora Network uh, in Belgium. And I would like to uh, go into the knowledge as a commons uh, a little bit further because I have the feeling I, I take up your challenge that let's not introduce commons through the back door but to the front door. So here I'll kick open a front door for you. I think we're, being, we're treating knowledge as a commons too much defensively, like uh, either knowledge is produced privately and then exploited, uh, so it's not democratically shared, etc., even by universities, or knowledge is found in communities and then privatized, such li as songs or stories or traditions or knowledge of plants, etc., etc. But I think... Um, there you talk about knowledge that is already uh, constituted somewhere and then we have to fight to get the access to it as a community. What I would like to talk about one step further is the production, the, act, the active production of knowledge by commons, by communities, is what, what we do. Because now, for example, all the knowledge about what is economy is produced by people who are just you know, destroying our world. What is work? You know, they say, oh, work is only if you get bank money for it. And like, 
who decides their power to define that? So knowledge as a common is, let's create knowledge in a democratic way by listening even to people who are excluded from this whole work system and then propose an alternative definition and knowledge about what works and what is work, etc., etc. So it's like an invitation to take knowledge as a commons one step further and actually create knowledge and more sustainable knowledge and more fair knowledge with everybody. Marco? Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Marco from Italy. I work on digital rights, open data, and uh, free software. And I only wanted to uh, make a short comment on Carolina's presentation to point out explicitly something that, in my opinion, is implicit in what she explained so well. And is the f it is the fact that uh, very often, she, Carolina explained that there is how big and, ba and bad is the danger of the enclosure of knowledge. I only wanted to uh, point out that sometimes the enclosure <coughs> of knowledge about commons happens involuntarily, of course, just by commoners, by activists. When they uh, work with computers, they work online, they often do, at least in my ex experience, they all too often forget to put the right licenses and, uh, the, and to use the right technologies, the right file formats for all their work, which means that all the work that an NGO produces, all the knowledge it produces for the commons with, without any reason to and motivation to profit or lock it, can go and is often lost after just a few years if those documents were not in open file formats or they were not published online with the right license because copyright law works in such a way that if you put online something without an explicit uh, license uh, that it can be reused and then you, not you physically, the, your organization disappears, that becomes an orphan work that cannot be openly reused in many ways. So uh, this happens very often and simply because there is no, not enough knowledge of these risks. This is the only thing I wanted to point out. Thanks. Okay. There was even a su suggestion from somebody here in the group that um, while we talk about a knowledge stream, etc., etc., somebody should count the Apple computers around here. Um. <laughs> Good suggestion. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. So... Hands up. Okay, so we take two more, go back to the panel, and then we do another round. Okay, Stefan, please. And then. Yes, my name is Stefan. Yeah. Uh, question to Jim. Uh, on the, you ask us uh, where does the money come from, from the tree or bank, state bank or what. But I, I think you forgot a question. Because uh, the, the, the most important thing uh, we can observe in this society is that we are not producing in, in commons, in, in, in a common, uh, in common condition. We are producing privately, which means we are separated from each other, which means we need a, an alien, I, I would say, a, a third means to bring us together, what we do before privately. And that is not the case in the commons. In the commons, we are acting together. We are acting commonly. We do not need an additional means to bring us together. We are creating our relationships of our own. So the question uh, I, would, I would like to hear is who believes that the money comes from the separation of the producers in the society? And this is the origin where the money comes from, I, I think. Hi, my, my name is Gwendolyn Hallsmith. I'm from the Independent Republic of Vermont. And I, could, I really enjoyed Jem's talk. I couldn't agree with you more that if commoners don't understand money, they don't understand why it's so hard to build the commons. Because money, the structure of money, undermines the commons in every way. And... I, if there are people here who don't understand why that is, I've actually brought this little fun social game 
that only takes about a half an hour to play, and we could play it in one of these self-organized sessions. Um, it was, it's based on Bernard Leotard's 11th round, for those of you who know his work. But I'd like you to speak for a minute or two, if you could, about how the mobilization of currencies outside of these bank debt money systems mobilizes both cooperation and abundance, because those are two of the themes I've heard a lot here, and I think the, the currency world actually has the potential to help the commons do that. Okay, last comment on this round. What was it here on the side? Oh, no, yeah, exactly. <coughs> I got it well, and then we have a first round of answers. I'm Jan Ingalls, and um, Jim and I did talk a little bit last night, and uh, I'm going to be guest editing an um, uh, integral review that's going to be regarding... Uh, the climate crises we're in, looking at the monetary system as being a possible key change point at a global level and looking at sustainability as being something we value and therefore how can we connect the, our monetary system to uh, sustainability values. And I'm just wondering if you could speak, Jim, to the short period of time that we have that you indicated and whether or not you see something happening at a global level with the monetary system that could be a quick shift of our behavior because we need something quick. And I, I certainly agree with Gwendolyn that um, the monetary system is a key point for our commons action. Well, yes. So um, the first thing that was mentioned is knowledge as a commons and I could not agree more and that's why I, I do admire all of you because you really work on that and that should be the key. I, I should say then that in what I do it, it also has to do with what you just referred and I want to take again the example of TPP and probably point it out with what Glyn Mo Moody uh, own fight is it's one of the issues in TPP is that investors can sue directly to the states. So if, if their um, profit that they expect to have in a contract with the state does not end up matching their expectations of profit. Do I understand myself? I make myself understand. Um, so the point is, if this treaty becomes a law, Exxon can um, sue a country like even, I don't know, you, the UK, because he was expecting to uh, produce a certain amount of petroleum and at the end the UK decided to finish the contract or probably a strike put down the profit he was going to get. The point, the central point here, which relates to what she mentions, is that this treaty is being negotiated in secrecy only by the governments. And they do not give access neither to the parliaments nor to the civil society. We only have access to what is being said through leaks. So they are deciding the definitions of the way trade is going to function in the next decades. Not just in intellectual property, but in issues like this one, which is, has direct relation with what you talk about, minery, water, all those stuff. So it's really important to engage into that and stop and who decided, who is going to decide what we're going to do. And that's also commoning. So in that part, we are building a commons knowledge and I'm doing my little part, even if it's not taking um, the common values right up from the door, but on the production of the commoning that depends on my field of expertise, I am taking action. And I suggest you look at those regulations too because they will impact terribly what you're doing. On what uh, Marco just mentioned too, um, again, I, I do think that there is a need of more bridges between... Um, natural resources communiers and digital communiers. There are a lot of things we can share. You've done a lot of um, thoughts in the past, a lot of struggles, 
and the issues, the way you discuss the concepts, the, this thing of reminding us what commons mean, and not just this small little feel like what Creative Commons does, that just take a small feel. It's very important for us to take, and you can learn from the way we develop and think about infrastructures. So really thinking a little bit on licensing, on where and what to use, it's very important to be coherent when you get into the digital world. I would stay there then. Just to mention this, because it came up before here in the, in the conference in several conversations, or TAFTA is just the equivalent of TPP, and all the enclosures are in those contracts, and it's, it's nothing new at all. It this work with the same principle for the last 25 years. So if you want to take action as commoners, in all the fields we are talking about, this might be a field of struggle. Perhaps it comes up again tomorrow in the open session. Yeah, firstly, just one comment on the two questions related to knowledge in the enclosure uh, and the latest trade agreements. Um, if you were trying to set up a law firm or a lobbyist and you went to the bank and said, I believe in the commons and I'm going to lobby against all this stuff and I'm going to employ loads of the world's best lobbyists to lobby against all these things, you're probably not likely to get a loan to set up that company and employ those people. Compared to if you go there and you say, well, I'm, I realize there are all these, these, these top firms and they want this legislation because this is going to therefore protect their profits, future profits, reduce risk, etc. Then that will sound like a more realistic business model. What am I saying? There is a monetary reason why certain types of people get resourced to do certain things to then lobby and lobby at WIPO, lobby for WTO, lobby in uh, bilateral trade agreements. And so this knowledge enclosure is the latest in a, a history of a hundred years of enclosure, partly because of this monetary system, debt-based money that requires commodification, monetization of all life. So I would say that because I'm making the point about why we need to work on money. So, And very well summarized, much better than me, Gwen. Thank you for saying that. Um, Stefan, you asked a question about um, perhaps one of the reasons for money is the fact that we are in some ways not more communal. I just think back to when I lived in communal housing. We had a rota. And the idea is, is that you were all meant to do a certain amount of hours of service to help keep the good functioning communal house. And you might go in debt if you skipped your, 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 your contribution that week or you didn't fully do all the cleaning hours or the cooking hours or the gardening hours. That's a form of currency. And it can actually enable a good functioning communal system. So... Currencies can be acknowledgments of value. They can be acknowledgment. They can they can be uh, metrics for reputation, or they can be point systems for enabling transactions. But they don't have to be. They can be just other other ways. So 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 I wouldn't. I, I, so we still need currencies, even if we move towards a sort of a, a a very utopian, collaborative, totally communal way of life. Um, But at the moment, the current monetary system we have is so much against that in the ways we've discussed that I really think we need to come up with systems which will encroach into this debt-based money world. So, so I'm, I appreciate what you're saying. Um, uh, Gwen, you asked... Um, Mobilize oh yes, talk about the types of mobilization that new forms of currency and monetary system enable. So basically, a lot of the mutual credit systems are allowing underused assets to be matched with unmet needs. So in any community, you'll have buildings standing empty or people underemployed, uh, and you'll have unmet needs for community, for care, for, uh, you know, care of the elderly, for example. And so these new systems, these new currencies enable complete those sorts of exchanges or transactions. And a wonderful one is, is going in Japan where people can care for the elderly and then earn points which then they can, can spend on, on, on care for themselves and they can store up. And that's being copied as well in Singapore and some other places. 
So that's just, just one example. Is, is that what you want me to do? To say how it can unleash our ability to collaborate and actually create, co-create value together. Um, the question, Jan, about monetary systems at the global level, so how there's, there's a number of ways of approaching that. I mentioned how I would like to see a new generation of community currency that is distributed. Yeah, so in this, in, currently we're sort of at the Napster level, with Napster meaning that you can shut these things down. And, uh, for example, in China, virtual currencies are illegal if, you want, if you're using them for buying real goods and services. In Sweden, there are some really sort of difficult laws on these issues. So... I think we need to say, well, actually, if we could create distributedly managed mutual credit currency systems, then like Bitcoin, it's out there and it can't be switched off. So uh, we, you may find that the, 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 um, the, uh, you would have affinity groups or lo more local circles of trust within this more connected global infrastructure. But um, that, for me, is it's actually a technical challenge which I think needs to be addressed uh, to create sort of a more like a mutual credit type Bitcoin. That's from the philosophy of let's just do it ourselves. Uh, that sort of, uh, sort of hacktivist and slightly anarchist, let's just get on and do it. There's another issue, which is, well, what could be done by governments or at an intergovernmental level to address this problem? Uh, there are a high variety of proposals. Um, things like the terror, uh, which now maybe has a new name. There are things that look a bit like it, such as the, as the Venn currency, so basically a basket of goods uh, which is used as, a, as a, unit, a global unit. Now, I think these things could be completely a distraction because e no matter what, it doesn't really matter what the unit is. But, and... Even if, for example, a lot of people talk about gold and they would like a return to gold or whatever, but we wouldn't. We wouldn't. We would end up trading in promises of gold. So the question is, who issues the promises? Who gets to do that? Who get, uh, whose promises are treated as legal tender? And, and how much interest do they charge? So we have to look at that mechanism because if we don't, coming out with some kind of global currency, if it's issued by banks at interest then that's almost like the final stage of our complete enslavement. So we, we have to understand money and monetary systems before we then start proposing solutions, you know, a post-dollar hegemony world, etc. I find that most people working at that level do not understand money. They do not understand this mechanism of how it's issued. So, so we need much more inter interesting discussions around that and good quality research and, and, and so on on that. I was asked to finish soon. Is this in your huge interest? Okay, so we take one or two more uh, and, and, and finish. Okay. Your hands are... It was... Um, okay, who did not speak in the plenary, if you may allow, right? A voter, I guess, did not speak. And you did not speak. I take this too. Okay, voter. <coughs> and that's it. Yeah, I, does it work? Hello? It does. Okay, sorry. Yeah, Jim, I really agree with your last comment where you said that why don't we just do it? I mean, commons is about doing it, right? I mean, issuing our own currency, well, Bitcoin has already been replicated in other projects. Bitcoin has its own weaknesses, and we know that. So uh, there are people from Frycoin here. Next to me is one uh, person, and I think there are other... Uh, Jaro Mills up, is very much involved in that movement. We can okay. just uh, build, define tomorrow or today the uh, commons cryptocurrency. And the most important thing is that we have shared this identity, that we do it, that we practice these relations. Uh, and within our networks, we start doing it. That's the only thing. And then that connects to uh, the knowledge commoning. I mean, we also need to s assure sustainability uh, of the knowledge commoning and of the other forms of commoning. So I think here, uh, this is just the perfect platform, this conference, where we should kick off such a project. Yes, thank Can you. Can I just add something? 
Thank you for that. I'm um, very pleased to meet the chap from Frycoin. So that's Bitcoin with Demirage, which yes. uh, fant- it'll be really interesting to see how, that, how that's going. I want to... Uh, can I add something shortly? Okay. Um, I fully agree what he said about it. We should act and start with doing something. And um, he also said we need a symbol or something. Um, my thing is that we should design us a nice symbol and run and bring with the currency or something like this the attention to symbol it and, and uh, to make a common platform that we can promote our projects worldwide and that we bring the attention to this. And until now, everybody looks at money and everybody is a focus on this. And so we can bring their big attention to this. That is the last intervention. Uh, hello, my name is Ursan. Um, I'm involved in many different co- forms of um, activism, lab- labor activism, consumer activism, <coughs> political uh, party. Uh, but recently, very recently, I'm involved in uh, Occupy 15th M, Take the Square movement. And we have, we have other friends from these... Uh, mobilizations and movements, protest movements. But what I want to say is, you know, against the um, spread of commodification of everything, a commodification of everything, there is, there is this counter-movement. And now in, in the West, in the center, we have this, this uh, movement, mass movement, is actually linking all these, linking all these uh, individual or, group, you know, all, all uh, counter counter uh, struggles to commodify, to decommodify uh, life and take it back. I think it is this is really interesting event. I mean, it shows these struggles, these mobilizations, these activism and thinking and inventing is coming together, and and I I think it's very near to to bring really different forms of organizations or struggles, groups, uh, together very soon. Okay. Last comment uh, here on the panel. And that's the Yeah, I, I love the sense of, of movement, but I recall that when I was in the anti-globalization movement in the late 90s, there was these, these older people back then who said what I'm about to say, which is that... Yeah, I remember when I was in the movement. We was everything seemed so possible, um, and we didn't really listen to them. So, one message: if we don't work on money, we lose. And your message? <laughs> uh, I I just think that if each of us put the piece that we know we can put, fear can change sides. Because I've been two years in Colombia fighting uh, intellectual property legislation, we started saying, okay, we, we're just fighting for a couple of souls because we know that we're going to lose the, 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 the war. So far, we've been winning four battles, and it didn't seem like we could two years ago. So we can put each of us. 